now? <laughs> uh, thank you, Pat. I, um, I just love Pat McGuire. I mean, honestly, that's, that's all there is to be said about it. And it's, you know, he's a great legislator. He is uh, extraordinary, and I mean extraordinary, chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee who takes that job seriously in a way that everyone should view as a model. But he's also the guy to go to if you need to figure out what CD to take on your trip home from Springfield. <laughs> he's the guy to go to if you're looking for a 19th century English poet to quote for a perfect situation in Springfield. He's the guy to tell you about the battles that the labor movement fought in the 1930s. He's a Renaissance man, and he's brilliant, and he's just the nicest guy in America. And, uh, I don't know why he's chosen to make the decision to endorse me, but I'm for whoever Pat McGuire is for. <laughs> I hope you all are too. Um, thank you for being with us there. I'm, I'm thrilled at the turnout, and so I know there's people standing in the back, but there are also chairs uh, folded up in the back. We will, uh, we will everyone can, can have a seat, I promise. And, um, I'm glad the front row is full. I don't bite, even though I used to be in classrooms all the time. But just come, come up close and we'll, we'll have a conversation. I'm Daniel Biss. I'm state senator for the 9th district, which is just north of the city of Chicago. I'm running for governor in Illinois. You might have known this before you walked in the door. I don't know. <laughs> and we are now on day three of a 10-day tour we're doing around the state. That doesn't mean, of course, that we weren't traveling the state before, that we wouldn't travel the state afterwards, but what it means is that we chose to take these 10 days to push aside all the other distractions. The fundraising work that takes so much time, unfortunately, these awful modern campaigns, the political meetings, all of that stuff is pushed aside just for us to be on the road for 10 days talking about the road forward for Illinois, talking about the fact that our state government has not functioned for the rest of us for way too long. Our state government has locked most of us out for way too long. Many of these meetings are at community colleges. I'm especially happy to be at Joliet Junior College today, the oldest public community college in the country. Because we're talking about the poor ladder of opportunity precisely for the population that our state government seems to have forgotten about. People in the middle class, and people striving to be in the middle class. And the kind of vicious disinvestment that Pat talked about has been visited upon our public university and especially community college system is the strongest evidence imaginable of where state government's priorities really lie, even as most people who run for office will tell you the priorities are somehow different than that. So this is a setting that I'm really excited about. It's a group of people I can't wait to talk with. And I want to just, because I've, I know I've been with many of you before, I want to just be a little bit different and to show you a few pictures to begin. Um, you can ignore that one. <laughs> but I wanted to start by introducing you to my family. Uh, I have the unbelievable good fortune to be married to Karen. We've been married for 11 years. We live in that house in Evanston with Elliot and Theodore, who are uh, a week from tomorrow going to be starting second and fourth grade. If you want to sort of step back for a minute, this is the outside of our house. We live in the left half. Kathy and Steve live in the right half. I think they're patriotic too. I just don't, that, that day the flag wasn't out. I can't explain it. Um, it's a modest home in the suburbs. But we're unbelievably fortunate, A, to be able to afford this modest home in the suburbs, but also uh, to be steps away from a wonderful neighborhood public school. So when Elliot and Theodore starts second and fourth grade a week from tomorrow, it's going to be at uh, the neighborhood public school, a wonderful school, a school that they're actually really, and maybe this says something disappointing about their enthusiasm for being around their parents all summer long, but a school that they're very excited to, turn, to return to in eight days. And we feel really, really blessed to live the life that we live, and fortunate and very lucky. But we also see that our family's story is a kind of an explanation of a lot that the state of Illinois gets wrong. So I want to talk, I want to leave our bucolic brick school behind and return to my old days of showing people charts and graphs with numbers on them. <laughs> Sorry in advance. <laughs> so I want to return to the year 2015, which is the last year that we have all the data for. And that year we were pretty fortunate. We made actually pretty close to $70,000. So we're lucky. That oh, 
teal almost. The bottom slice there, whatever color you want it to be, represent the pro represents the property taxes that we paid. And the orange slice on top of it represents the income taxes that we paid. And those two tax bills together added up to 11% of our income. So we were fortunate we made close to $70,000 a year. And to state and local taxes, we paid about 11%. <clears throat> I wanted to compare uh, our family situation to the Rauner family situation for the same year. But we ran into some trouble uh, with building codes around putting a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you actually can't see the entire top of the graph. So I wanted to rescale it for the next one. There's the Rauner family in the same year when they did even better than we did, making 60 some thousand dollars a year. They made actually $188 million that year. And if you look at the property income tax slice and add them together, they paid about 4% in taxes. So we actually blew up my income. I wish it were as high as that, it's, but we wanted it to be visible just so we knew what part of the screen it was on. <laughs> we paid 11% and the rounders paid 4%. And again, we're very fortunate, we're very lucky. I'm not here to complain, but the bad news is that the 11% that we're paying tells you the story of what families across Illinois that aren't as fortunate as us are obligated to pay. And so, before we stop numbing your minds with the math professor's charts, again, sorry, I want to tell you the story. It's not just about one guy and his family, but about what happens in the state of Illinois. As you move from the left to the right across this screen, you move from the top of our economic scale to the bottom. The leftmost bar is for the bottom 20%, then the next 20%, then the middle 20%. Then the next 20% after that. Then the next 15, the next four, and finally the top 1%. And what do you find? The more you make in Illinois, the less you pay. The more you make, the less you pay. The poorest people in Illinois are paying not the 11% that we're lucky to only have to pay, but 13%. That's what we make the poorest people in our state do. And the more you make, the less and less it becomes until you're really at the very top top 1% pay 5%. So this is the system we have built for ourselves in the state of Illinois. We've built a tax system that says if we want to fund government, when we try to enable Joliet Junior College to be adequately supported, when we think about what it takes to run a school system, what we do first is we ask the people who least to pay a whole bunch, we ask the people in the middle to pay a little bit less, and at the end of the day, if we remember, we maybe ask the people at the top to pay a little bit of something. When Pat McGuire talks about my passion for modernizing the tax code, this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. And what I want you all to understand is it does not need to be this way. This graph wouldn't look the same if you analyzed it in Wisconsin or Iowa, for example, as Pat mentions, or in most states in the Union. In fact, this graph is worse than all the three or four other states in the entire country. In the entire country. In Illinois, we go after the poor. In Illinois, we punish the middle class. And we do it because the very wealthy citizens who bought our government get to decide how the system works. To me, that's what this campaign is about. Our Constitution is part of the, the problem is here. Our Constitution is one of only four in the Union that say that we must have a flat income tax. One of only four in the Union that say that if you make $188 million a year like Bruce Rauner, we may not ask you to pay a higher rate than someone who makes $20,000 a year, or $10,000 a year, or $70,000 a year. That's baked into our Constitution. Only four other states have that. If we want to fix that, we have to fix our Constitution. What is the consequence of that? One part is this stuff. There's another consequence. There's another consequence. Because the way the economy in Illinois and frankly in our country has evolved means that more and more money has gone to the top. We can't ask, we can't access that money without taxing people who haven't gotten a raise. And therefore the income tax just hasn't kept up to bring in revenue the state needs. And therefore, we're over on property taxes. What does that mean? 
Number one, that means that our property taxes are preposterously high, which is seen here. But number two, it means that our property taxes play an, play an outsized role in funding our schools. And that means that our school funding is preposterously inequitable. Preposterously inequitable. More than any other state. We're not even third worst, or fourth worst, or even second worst. We are the most inequitable state in the country when it comes to funding our schools. And so, I want to refer to one other turn of phrase that Pat used. He was kind enough to praise me for not nibbling around the edges. We better not nibble around the edges. We better not nibble around the edges. We need a fundamental transformation. We can't allow that. We can't just not allow that. We can't allow a school system that mirrors that. We can't allow a school system that says, while we're taxing the poor more, we're paying for their schools less. While we're asking more of the middle class, we're making it harder and harder for them to educate themselves. This is not a system that works for most of us. And the solutions to this, which I'm happy to talk about in detail if y'all are interested in, are not complicated or new or different. They're already in force in many states in this country. They've already been campaign platforms of lots of people running for office. But then, when government starts to move forward and try to do what it ought to do, the people who pay for the campaigns have their voices elevated and amplified, and nothing fundamental ever really changes. This is the moment to make those transformations. This is the moment to finally think boldly. This is the moment to reject either the idea that we have to be incremental and can't really do too much at once, or also the idea that things are too politically difficult to even bother trying. This is the moment to build a political movement needed to reject the voices that have stopped us from fixing our system and build an Illinois government that works for the rest of us. That's what brought me to the race for governor. That's what brings me to Joliet Jul Junior College on a Sunday afternoon, and that's why I can't wait to have this discussion. So with that, it's your turn. Um,